Harrison Freiman. This is a show about all things real estate, business, marketing, entrepreneurship. Each show consists of myself, Matt Literacy, and a member of my team and a guest. This week, the Matt Literacy Group team member joining us is Catherine Halbrook. Catherine, how are we doing today? Good, good, good. Catherine, how many times now have you appeared on the podcast? I think maybe four. Four? This is my fourth time. Yeah. Okay. And and usually yours are the most watched out of everybody's. Really? In the room. No, that's not true. <laughs> uh, well, this <laughs> is the first week you've said my name right, so I appreciate that. Yeah, I still after can't six say last years name. Uh, of working for him. So episode nineteen is about what it takes to succeed in real estate, and this week we have Mario Greco. Mario, how are we doing today? Good. Mario, how long you been in real estate for? Uh, almost eighteen years. Wow. And did you start off in real estate? Was that your original career? I did not. Um, I went to college thinking I was going to be a doctor. Okay. Uh, by the end of my freshman year, I decided I was going to be a chemical engineer. By my junior year, I decided to not do that um, after actually being an intern. like an in, uh, It's called a co-op, an in-year intern at a chemical company. Uh, stopped that, decided to go to law school. Wow. But before that, I got another degree in environmental engineering. So I went to law school. Um, practiced for about six, almost seven years, and then left that to do this. So first off, these are a lot of like <laughs> big degrees to get. I'm, I'm assuming you got pretty good grades. I, I, I did. Did yeah. you tell me what you got in your uh, ACT or SAT? Did you take one of those? At 33 <laughs> on my ACT and oh, wow. 1,400 on my SAT. Damn. You know, I got a 19 on my ACT. <laughs> get out of here. I swear to God. I got a 19. My, uh, my parents thought something was wrong with me. Did you me. take I'm it again? Just, uh, I was just like, screw it. I mean, that's why I went to the Harvard of the Midwest, which <laughs> yeah. is Eastern Illinois University. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but which yeah. is not even a college anymore. I, don't think. I, I think they're losing. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to be a college next year. So. Are they the yeah. Leathernecks? Uh, no, no, no. We're oh, what are the Panthers. Those? Panthers. That's, that's right. We, are. we had Tony yeah. Romo. You know? yeah, that's right. So, um, so, okay. So what made you go from being an attorney to wanting to get into real estate? Um, it's interesting. I met, so I, I, was, I was becoming disenchanted with practicing law, not, not the law part of it, but the the practice part of it. The did you being, do real estate law? No, I didn't. No. I, I did intellectual property litigation, so patents, patent and trademark litigation. Um, I, I felt like uh, the 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 yeah the law part of it was fun. I liked that, but the office politics, the being 26 years old at a firm that already represented everyone on the planet, I was not going to be able to really do much of uh, much moving up, sort of business wise. I'd have to move up, um, sort of as a you know, as an, uh, an attorney or an associate who lived at the office. I really had no interest in doing that. So um, five years into it, I met Brad Lippitz, okay. um, who was representing a house that I was looking at um, to buy for myself, and I had already uh, was living in a condo. Well, long story short, Brad, um, I bought the house that Brad was listing, unrepresented, and he sold our condo. Um, and I, after the closing of the second property, I think it was the condo, it, talked to him and said, how did you get into this? Because this is kind of, it seems interesting to me. And I was always reticent, or not reticent, I was always kind of, I looked at realtors as like, you know, kind of people that got lucky with nice cars that mm -hmm. just took phone calls and <laughs> yeah, cash checks. Yeah. Sometimes like a lot of our clients think we still are. But yeah. <laughs> Brad was the first agent I had met that was, I, I sort of thought, wow, this guy's highly educated, well-spoken, like has a real pre-career. I'm like, this is interesting. And I just talked to him probably for about a month, you know, had coffee with him maybe a couple times for the next month or two and uh, decided I'm going to do this. It still took two years yeah. to leave, mm -hmm. but um, I did it. And part of the reason why I left is because I had finally paid off my student loans. So I had okay. no debt. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things Sorry, I wanted yeah. to do is if I'm going to go be self-employed, I was going to not have debt Stay and have some free. savings. With, yeah. with all those degrees, I would assume there had accumulated quite a bit of debt. So I had, I had no debt from college. I was lucky oh, wow. enough to okay. go to I was lucky enough to go to Northwestern on a full scholarship called the Evans Scholarship. It's okay. like a caddying scholarship. Okay. If you guys have heard of the Western Open, um, it used to be the Western Open. Now it's like the BMW Open. That's the main fundraiser for the Evans Scholar Foundation. So I went to college for free. Then That's I went great. to law school and incurred about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt. Okay. And luckily, and maybe coincidentally. I bought my first place pre-construction at the Alt Geld Club, 1350 West yeah, Fullerton. Yeah. Bought it pre-construction and sold it for just about what I owed on my student oh, wow. loans. Wow. Cool. So I was able to eliminate that mm -hmm. debt, um, bought the new place, and I thought, well, I'm debt-free. I'm starting to accumulate some savings, and I wanted to leave when I had about a year's worth of savings in the bank, which I think actually is yeah. critical to starting in any self-employment, let alone real estate. You need to have a cushion, otherwise you're going to make decisions that aren't 
in your client's interest, you're gonna be in your interest. Yeah, you're gonna be a little bit driven by money. It's, yeah. it's funny that Brad Lippitz was a guy, I mean, I love Brad, he's mm -hmm. one of my favorites. How many yeah. deals throughout the years have you and Brad done? Maybe five. Really? Yeah. Are you guys still, are you <laughs> yeah, yeah, we still? talk all the time, yeah, yeah, yeah we talk. Yeah, yeah that's, that's awesome, yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So what made you like love real estate? Was it that sale, making the money off it, or was it just something you were naturally attracted to? I think once I got into it, what was attractive um, and what I liked a lot was being able to actually have a hand in the decisions, not a hand, actually have, be the person that the client is listening to for the advice, mm -hmm. not the associate who told the junior partner, who told the senior partner, this right. is what we should do, and yeah. by then it was diluted and it really wasn't your mm -hmm. decision anyway. Right. In this case, in real estate, um, you know, when a client says, let's list the house, you give yeah. them the price, it sells, they accept the price, like all of those decisions yeah. that they make were your advice, and I thought that yeah. was very gratifying. Uh, yeah. The money's not terrible either. People <laughs> ask all the time, like, God, why'd you leave the law? I'm like, I couldn't afford to be a lawyer anymore, <laughs> yeah. honestly. Well, what would yeah. you say to people trying to get their law degree now? Like, you know, I would say do it, but I would say assume you probably won't practice um, for a long time, but it's a great degree to have. I think it teaches you how to think um, analytically as well as um, see both sides of pretty much every issue. And I think in our business, it gives you a stamp of legitimacy like right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not like some, some of these... I mean, there are a lot of people in our business that are, you know, working the bar and then also, yeah. you know, being agents. And, you know, I respect anybody that's trying to hustle, but I think it's a little bit different when they interview them and then you go on the listing appointment and you're like, well, you know, I got my, you know, law degree yeah. and all that other stuff. I mean, I think it kind of gives you a little bit more clout. It Absolutely. helps. It helps yeah. a lot. It, it allows, I think, people to trust you quicker and more completely and also, I think, gives you the benefit of the doubt when maybe things don't go the right way. They don't think, oh, well, this yeah. idiot's a bartender. Of course yeah. he doesn't know what he's talking yeah. about. It's more like, wow, this guy, let yeah. alone I've been doing it for a long time, but even yeah. in the beginning, it allowed me to, to have uh, the benefit of the doubt a lot. So, so how did you start then? And, um, you know, coming out of, you know, what were you, 26, 27 when you got into real estate maybe? I, no, I was 32. 32, because you're only like 35 now, so it's like three right. years, huh? Yeah. So, so you're 32. In dog years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you start 32, and you know, you, you're probably making good money you know, uh, and, and as a lawyer, and you get into real estate starting at zero, going back to the bottom. You know, um, How did you get from there to like, did you, did you automatically be successful, or did it take you, how long did it take you, think? So I, I was lucky in that I got in, so I, I got my license on January 11th of 2002. I left the law on September 4th of 2002. So in those nine months while I was leaving the firm I was at, um, A, I was doing some deals uh, with people at the firm, with anyone I could, you know, anyone who came my way, I would, I would help. Yeah, I wasn't really doing much. Utilizing your sphere and stuff right. like that, yeah. Doing as much as I could while still trying to, you know, keep my job because it was still pretty demanding. But um, when I left, you know, in September of 2002, uh, it was a good time to sort of get into real estate because... The peak hadn't yet happened, but it was building. Um, the the internet and all the things we have now, podcasts, et cetera, weren't there. So your personal relationships mattered. Right. And I really kind of, I, what I said to myself was, I'm going to be a CTA bus. I'm going to pick up anyone who comes my way. I'm not right. going to be a limousine. I'm not going to have my face on a bench in the Gold Coast saying, I'm the Gold Coast expert. I literally right. would do anything from Rogers Park down to Bronzeville over to wherever. Right. Um, so that helped. Um, kind of established myself. And I, at, at first I worked, I mean, 18 hours a day, six yeah. days a week. Did you like work on your own right away? Like an all, assistant? I worked on my own. Nothing? I worked on yeah. my own um, in, starting in September. And then by Thanksgiving, I uh, hired an assistant and split him with uh, Tim Sheehan. Of oh, all yeah. people. Yeah. He's I was a good guy, sir. He, oh, yeah. Tim's a great guy, too. Tim's a great yeah. guy, yeah. He's a fellow Sox outsider. Yeah, he is. <laughs> fellow Sox fan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was at, do you have ever had, are you a Sox fan? I am. He's she not. Is. I'm a Cubs fan. Ah, I thought <laughs> yeah. we were going to be three for three. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, anyway, I, I split someone with Tim and then by the next February, I decided to, um, keep him completely and then hire someone else to answer the phones. So one of the things that I remember when I was, before I met Brad and when I was sort of monkeying around looking at property, I hated getting voicemails. Mm -hmm. I hated not getting a return phone call. So I always said to myself, I, I, if I ever get to the point where I have someone answering my phones or I can't answer my phone every time it rings, right. I'm hiring someone. Yeah. So I hired someone to be in the office and then um, the first person that I had split with Tim then became my sort of out of office, like a showing agent. And yep. then it kind of yeah, went yeah. from there. And I remember the day that it, uh, I decided to hire the person in the office. It was a day where I had a, an inspection, I had an appraisal, I had a buyer to go out with and then someone called in for a listing appointment and I couldn't return the phone calls fast enough 
and I actually lost the yes, opportunity sir. to get the listing appointment. Like lo yeah. lost the opportunity, yeah. let alone the listing. Yeah, yeah. I thought, well, if I had someone yeah. actually doing this and scheduling, not that I'm above yeah. it, but if someone was doing this, I, I could have done all of it and actually had some time. Yeah. So that's, the, I remember that, that day That is actually clearly. something nice about your team that I appreciate, that there's always somebody able to answer the phone if we need to switch something totally. around. Yeah, or, it's a big difference. It is I mean, great, yeah. But it's, it's, it's funny that early on, only a couple years in, that you, you, you uh, realize that you could utilize people as time, because time is the best commodity in this business. Because right. like the more time you can have to get new business, and have your team work the old and you know business you have today is what's going to make you most successful. And I think that's the biggest problem that agents have out there is that they're afraid to invest in themselves because people cost money. But if you could, you know leverage those people to get more time, you could get more money on top of it. And people people just don't get that. I've never hired someone and it not paid for itself. That's right. That's how you should look at it. It's like yeah. the first person to do it. If you pay them, let's say fifty five thousand dollars a year, they should at least allow you to get $55,000 more of business. And you can't just think about it for the 55,000 that year. You have to think that like, if you sell somebody something next year, they're probably gonna refer you one person. Right. And then three years from now, they're probably gonna sell again. So it's, it's more than that. So, right. and I think people forget that there's residuals that come back. I think agents are generally short sighted, not because they're not smart. It's more because they're f scared and yeah. fear is a bad way to go about being self-employed. I don't care if you're an agent or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we established with my 19 on ACT, you don't have to technically be smart to <laughs> right. be successful in this business. Or so. at least not a good test taker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so that like, was the nice way to yeah. put it. <laughs> yeah. So like, uh, you know, so you've been on top. I mean, honestly, Mario, you've been um, a, a guy I've personally idolized since I got in the business. You're always like somebody I've always looked up to and I've really like wanted to like you know, try to become and, and secede. Uh, and I've always looked up to you. And uh, how have you been able to stay on top for so long? You know, because you've always been one of the top three agents since I've even been in the business and that's been since 06. Yeah. Um, it, it's a lot of, it, it's, it's less hard work than it is smart work. Yeah. Um, I, I think as I've grown professionally, I've realized, as you mentioned before, you have to leverage your time. So yeah. you have to um, if not hire other people, you have to figure out how to outsource things that um, will make you more productive, or if you keep them less productive. Uh, one of the things I did very early, probably around the time you got into the business, um, I used to, because I was a lawyer and had a salary, I knew what I was going to make every two weeks. I knew that check was going to be there, and I could plan, I could you know plan a vacation, I could plan to go do things and not worry about, holy crap, am I going to be yeah. able to make my mortgage payment? Well, I hired an accountant and a bookkeeper that year, and I still have him. Um, and every Thursday, his office sends me all the cash balances in my accounts. And every Wednesday, my office manager in my group sends me all of our pending deals with pending income. So by Friday, before the weekend, before I, I need to sort of in. go away, I, I know sort of where I stand financially. That has liberated me to not only have fun when I can, but also right. realize I can afford to hire someone else. I can yeah. afford to do whatever I need to do for my Keep business and reinvest everything. in my business, but frankly also live a life um, that I want to live and not worry about it. So I'm able to plan more because of it. So I think that was the overarching thing that caused me to, to sort of free my mind. And from there, what has kept me, um, I guess, on top is I, I, I've never feared um, hiring when I need to hire, right. firing when I need to, when I need to fire, um, but also um, figuring out what exactly I like and I'm good at. So today, as I sit here today on May 15th of 2019, I do five things all day other than this. I will answer any call that comes in. Yep. My email will be answered. I, I treat emails and voicemails like grenades with the pin pulled out. Yep. They are returned yeah. immediately or they are delegated immediately. Yeah. Right. Um, I look at the MLS a ton of times a day. I uh, go get feedback from buyer's agents that, done our show, that showed our listings and then I do sh the important showings. That's it, literally. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how a sign goes up. I don't know yeah. how a Tribune ad gets placed, nothing. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how things get posted to Instagram. <laughs> that all someone else does. And um, that liberates me to not only be more available. So mm -hmm. a lot of times clients can't be like, wait a minute, how did I just catch you at two o'clock on a Thursday? It's like, right. because I'm, this is yeah. my job. Yeah. Right. So um, you're not I'm able to get your nails done, you know, or whatever, or yeah, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I work out in the middle of the day. Yeah, I work yeah. out from noon to two, uh, yeah. Monday through Thursday. So yeah. b between noon and two, someone in my office is actually reading my email and yeah. responding and saying either Mario's in an appointment or they're responding for me. Yeah. So availability, which goes back to that time where I said I don't want anyone to ever get a voicemail. Yeah. When you answer, when you respond first, you get the business maybe more than half the time merely by primacy of response. Them. That's it. Well, I always yeah. say that all the time. You know, it's. It, 
you know, the sense of urgency where Jimmy John's Uber society. So you have to get back to people like right away that mm-hmm. that grenade. I actually say that same exact line because yeah. it's it's it is literally like that, because if you're not willing to answer it, the, one of the other 44,000 agents are going to be able to do it. Yeah. And it's interesting that you, you know, you're so to- cognitive of uh, your expenses, because that way you can know if like, you know, an opportunity comes to invest in something you can afford it or not afford it. And then knowing and leveraging what you're good at, you know, your strengths and weaknesses. Like, I'm sure you don't like setting up appointments, so you hired someone that's good at it, right? You yep. know, and maybe you don't like showing $200,000 properties, so you have a showing agent that could do that for you. you I know? don't even like returning phone calls from warm leads, let alone, I've never cold called in my yeah. life, but when someone calls in or emails in and says, hey, we got your name from so-and-so, I want you to possibly list our place. I don't even like returning that call. Yeah. So yeah. I have someone do. who does that. And all right. she does is set up new business, yep. um, set up listing appointments, uh, does my CMAs, I analyze them, she edits them, and then I go to a listing appointment. You have everything right Everything's there. Like yeah. I, I, right. I spend 20 minutes going mm-hmm. over the CMA, and that's how the listing appointment happens. Yeah. Whereas I, I've talked to a lot of agents. She, um, an agent I just did a deal with, a really, really large, actually my largest buyer deal ever, mm-hmm. just did it a couple weeks ago, and the listing agent. How big was that? Four million. Oh, wow. That's good. And the uh, listing agent said, you know, I've, I've got two listing appointments coming up this week. He goes, I've been spending hours and hours all day. I'm missing okay. phone calls. Yeah. I'm thinking, geez, I, I told him, I said, it, t- it takes me 20 minutes to get yeah. ready for a listing appointment. He's like, how? And I told him the infrastructure. He's like, well, that's expensive. I'm like, sure it is. It's yeah. 30 grand a month. But, but that's not that much yeah. when you yeah. think about what that can actually free up for the you. The amount yeah. of time. Don't you feel, though, like, because I'm the same way. I never understand how people study for these things so long. I mean, I also think, like, you know, we both do a lot of volume. So it's almost like it. I, I would say that nine out of ten times I already generally know wh- what it's worth. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just like, you know, I, within 20,000. And then you look at the comps and then you can kind of nail it down from there. And you're usually within like 1% because you do – you know, if you do 50 deals in Lincoln Park within a block and then you get a listing appointment there, it's like you kind of know. Not that hard. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got, you're like, well, I just sold four of these last week. Yep. So yep. here's what we ran into because you've analyzed the feedback because I know you're really good at getting yeah. feedback too. So you kind yeah. of, I mean, 20 minutes is like, yeah, maybe max to kind of. That's true. And the, the other thing too, I think, is is I've, I've long ago established, it, not only based on what I thought, but also now based on data, Price, there's two things to price for. One is to get traffic and the other is to get the offer. There's a quartile, sometimes a, a, a 50,000, sometimes 100,000, depending on the price point. But there is a range within which you need to be. Yeah. So yeah. you don't lose the traffic and you can still get the offer. Yeah. So um, when agents sort of try to f- pinpoint the, the price too closely, A, it sets the wrong expectation. Right. And B, it, it doesn't allow for the market. I mean, I've, I'm sure you do too. I have yeah. listings on the market right now that I cannot believe haven't sold, that yeah. literally are underpriced. Right. And yet I have a listing that actually sold before it hit the market last week, that I thought the price should be X. The seller said, how about X plus 50? And we ended up getting X plus 75. Yeah. yeah. So if you don't leave that range for yourself, you're setting yourself up yeah. uh, for, for, for an issue. And yeah, at the end of the day, um, yeah, you have to be somewhat malleable. And, and not salesy, but you have to let them understand that you don't control everything. And I'm yeah. sure you run into this too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're Mario Greco. You're Matt Laracy. How do you not know the price. Why hasn't this sold in a week like my neighbors did? Like you have to be ready to explain. Honestly, we get as much, we probably get more credit than we deserve when things sell quickly and we get way too much uh, flack when things don't Don't, sell. When some stuff sells really quickly, I always say too, you know, real estate's a lot about timing and and I admit to my sellers, like sometimes we just get lucky, you know, like, I mean, I think I'm really good at my job, but you know, every now and then, you know, you pull a horseshoe out of your ass. Like you said, you know, you would, you would, Almost didn't want the listing because they wanted 50 more. Be like, fuck yeah. it. Like, maybe I'll be able to take it. And yeah. then you get 75 over what you thought it was worth. Like, you yeah. know, like, you know, every now and then there's one guy that's just one overpay for it. And Agreed. you still happen to have the real, you know, the listing at the time. Agreed. The thing that sucks is when you lose the listing yeah. and then somebody else gets it and they get that yep. lucky buyer and yep. then you look like the idiot. Yep. So, but anyways, yep. how, how, like, do you get burnt out at all being in this? <laughs> like, are you, are you the type that burns out? I, I don't, um, partially because I really truly have figured out what it is I'm good at and what it is I like to do. I, I, I have to say that, um, I think I'm, I didn't mention this before, but I, I was going to. I go to bed every night with my inbox completely empty yeah. and everything either deleted, mm-hmm. filed, or delegated. Yeah. I actually find that fun. Like, I will do that yeah. before bed. It's not like a chore. I actually like yeah. it. Yeah. So um, that would be the thing I think that would burn you out the most. Um, that, that doesn't bother me. I, I do get a bit burned out sometimes when I have a bunch of deals that are kind of either tough to put together or tough to keep together and it's not through any fault of the market or the seller or the buyer but maybe the other agent or the appraisal and that gets really tiring um but no i I really don't burn out i actually like the the few things i do all day i like yeah Yeah. i mean the 
to me, I love the highs and lows. Like right now, I, I think this is always the most frustrating time of year in, in the middle of May because I think you have a lot of uh, renters that are posing to be buyers. So things are a little bit more difficult and deals kind of tend to fall. You, you lose a little bit more deals at this time of year. At least we have the last, I look at the last five years and we always lose our most like right around at this time. Yeah. So it, it's not that I get burnt out, I get more frustrated. Oh, yeah. And maybe my, my temper yes. is, is a little it's bit shorter, shorter yeah. than it, it normally <laughs> is. And considering that I have a newborn baby yeah. not sleeping on top of it, sometimes it <laughs> yeah. can be a time bomb. But I can't even imagine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like, how about that? Like, and speaking of that, like, what about you? How are you able to balance uh, life and work? Um, way, 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 way better than anyone could possibly imagine. Um, <laughs> okay. Because I actually, and this is interesting, my wife sells wine for a living. She's a district manager, but really in name only. She's a, she's a super rep, I call her, that she has her own, her own run of, of restaurants and clients, and then she manages five other people. She tries to do all of their jobs. What I do, and the reason I can balance, is I only do those few things a day, mm -hmm. And if there's anything else going on, you do, you know. someone's going to let me yeah. know about it. I'm not going to worry about it. And yeah. the one thing I tell my wife and I tell anyone who asks, like, how do you put up the stress? I'm like, stress, really, you create for yourself. Mm -hmm. I always ask, what's the worst thing that can happen? In our business, it's lose the listing, right. yeah. lose the deal, or lose the buyer. Right. Not one of those three things will cause me to yeah. lose sleep, miss yeah. a mortgage payment, or not yeah. take my next vacation. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's, not how, I, that's how I balance yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a good way to kind of look at it. That it's you know your world's not crashing down. I mean, right. I could take it. I take a loss <laughs> from <the market> sometimes. <laughs> it's, well, I, it's I do. Just yeah, I like, do. But uh, it goes yeah. away right away. Like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It's a short thing. It's yeah. like and a couple something hours. Good happens, yeah, and, and then, then you're, you're like, like, oh. like, oh yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so, what about like, um, like you know, seeing other brokers as you talk about calling up? Like, what's the biggest mistake? The biggest mistake you see other brokers make when they're starting off and things? When they get busy enough, where they can't return that phone call to the appraiser, the buyer, the listing appointment, the inspector, and they're you know working till midnight. Um, not investing or not taking the leap and hiring someone, even uh, part time or mm -hmm. even you know a contract worker, yeah. or in the summer, go get an intern from DePaul's real estate school yep. and have them answer your phone. I, I think that's. I think a lot of brokers, a lot of agents, uh, operate from operate out of fear. They yeah. they are trying not to go broke instead of trying to actually uh, make their business mm -hmm. grow, um, and, and that's a that's a big mistake. I think the other mistake is, and this is a little bit more subjective. Um, I never use the word my when I say, like in an email or when I'm negotiating, it's never my buyer or my seller. It's the buyer or the seller. Yeah. And I think when agents start to identify with their clients as like their buddy or mm -hmm. unless it's their family member, um, they get emotional and they actually, yeah. instead of removing the emotion, they actually insert it. Um, and I think a lot of agents kind of treat their clients as personal friends, whether or not they are, but during the negotiation they do. And I think that actually hurts them. I, I agree with you. I... I treat this like a business and I'm running a, like a business, you know, and that's the way I look at it. And like my, my clients are literally clients and like people ask about the drinks and dinner and stuff like that. And I don't want to do it because then it gets a little, to me, it gets awkward then, you know, first off, some people could get drunk and like, it's just, yeah. you know, yeah. now I know I'm on a different I've heard level. You say that before. Yeah. Yes. And it's, it's just kind of yeah. weird. And then like a deal comes along and something happens and then it's like, they're trying to be buddy, buddy with you. And like, to me, I like to be on a different level platform where they're looking to me for advice. I'm their business advisor. And that's it. And Correct. It are you friends like with them. Are you friends with your accountant, your wills and estates lawyer? Yeah, your never. no, yeah. right? So again, not to bring my wife up, I love her to death, but she's friends, tries to be friends with all of her clients and all of her reps and all of her people right. that she report to her. So when something happens and she has to reprimand, she can't. She won't go around someone to get something done because she doesn't want to hurt the feelings of yeah. someone who she considers right. a friend. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say this in the nicest way. I don't want to be friends with people that work with me. Yeah. I don't want to be friends with my clients. As you said, yeah. I want my clients to come to me when they need advice. Yeah. And I want the people that work for me to realize this is work. This isn't, you know, it, we can be cordial and we go out as a group and whatever. But to be friends um, is just, it, I think it's counterproductive. I don't think it's, and like, I don't mean it in a, in a rude or negative way. I just think, and it's not that I don't like all, a lot of my clients. Like, there's a lot of clients yeah. that if I did go out, I would, oh, they would be, they would be definitely guys I would go out with. 100%. But the reality is it just, I tried doing it like my first two years in the business. And I, to me, I was like, I'm definitely, I knew right away that was the, the bad idea. And I never did it since. Yeah. Because I think it could get awkward. And, and a couple of the guys that work for us, they, they tried going that route. And I told them why not to do it. And now they're like, now I see why you don't want to do it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just, a, it's a different level of platform respect. Now so, it's natural. It's natural for a human to think if I'm friends with them, they'll come back to me. They'll refer their friends and it'll be this big, happy family. Mm -hmm. But I think it's counterintuitive in that if you are friends, they may come to you and ask for a favor. Mm -hmm. They may ask for something, for advice for their friend. And they don't look at you as someone who 
does what you do. It's more like, oh, it's my buddy who happens yeah. to sell real estate. And right. they forget that you're actually, this is your business. Yeah. So when, yeah. like, when a client asks for a discount, whether or not you give it to them for whatever reason, um, if you're friends, how are you going to say no? Yeah. Right. right? If you're not friends, you can say, look, this is my livelihood. You want yeah. to go through the numbers? The, the 5% you think I'm making actually yeah. turns out to be one and a quarter when all is said and done. And right. yeah. the light bulb goes off. If it's a friend, it's a harder conversation to yeah. have. Yeah. yeah. And you, you were mentioned about like, uh, you know, hiring and, and leveraging time and stuff like that. Like, what's an interview process look for you? Like, how, how do you know it's a good fit for you? Because like, you know, I know I, I have to fire people all the time. We just did a couple recently. And, you know, it's it's. It sucks to do it. Nobody, I don't get enjoyment out of letting somebody go. Um, I, I, I dislike it. You know, but, um, you know, sometimes you know it's not the right fit. But, like, how do you find the talent and how do you uh, interview them to, to, to go through the process? So uh, office and sales is different. So for sales, it's usually someone we identify um, either that we've done a deal with and we try to recruit them or it's someone that comes to us. And a lot, a yeah. few times it's been clients that yeah. have been wanting to get into the business. And yeah. Um, they've come our, our way. I, I guess I would say this. Uh, on a, as a blanket, officer sales, if they've been in the food and beverage industry, yeah. they I, yeah. I, I automatically think they may actually work out because yeah. they are used to working incredibly hard right. for what is people. not yeah. proportional mm -hmm. compensation because this in our business, let's be real, for the first year, you're working a ton and not making as much as you should be, yeah. yep. but also interacting with people. Yep. Um, always, you know, if, if you're the the host or hostess at a, a you know a Boca restaurant and someone has a problem, yep. you making that problem right or having it go away is a special talent. Yeah. And I think in our business, it's not sales; it's actually consulting. It's right. it's building yeah. trust, and I think that helps. And in the off on the office side, um, I think that's the same as well. You you need to put yourself behind. Your job, and I yep. think in, in our business, a lot of uh, a lot of salespeople don't get that. And in an office, in the office environment, whether or not you're a millennial or a Y or a Z or whatever, um, if you don't understand that the client comes first, and that, for example, if you if you are my scheduler and the client calls in and asks to speak to me, you should know that yes, they're a client. Call Mario on his yeah. cell phone. However, when someone calls in and they're a lender and they obviously are a yeah. uh, whatever, they're looking for business email market. Yeah. Like those are the things you that I think food and beverage understands, yeah. right? Yeah. So on the office side, um, I look for, depending on the, um, depending on the, on the job, um, I ask certain questions that give me an answer that, um, I can read into. For example, you know, if someone says, oh, I know Chicago really well. Okay, fine. Pronounce that street. Yeah. And it's Paulina. And they yeah. say Paulina, they will never work for yeah. me as a or scheduler. Or right? Or <laughs> yeah. Or Gothi. Or Gothi, yeah. right? Yeah. And then a, and a salesperson. So one of the first questions I ask a salesperson, oh, yeah. one of the first questions I ask a salesperson is, why do you want to get into real estate? And if the answer is because I want to make my own schedule, they are also automatically yeah. withdrawn yeah. from consideration because right. yeah. you don't have your own schedule. Exactly. You have 50 schedules mm -hmm. or right. 75, however right, many right. clients you have, exactly. that you're on their schedule. Right. Totally. Yeah. Exactly. And then uh, how, how many people do you have on your team now? I think about 22. Okay. Is that including office people? Yeah. yeah. So okay. I have like uh, 10 or 11 in the office and about the same amount in sales. Okay. Yeah. I, and are you trying to get more people or what's your, what's your goal with Not that? Not necessarily. I, in fact, I just hired someone, uh, a really experienced agent who came over from Remax. Um, I am looking to, on the sales side, to get um, more established agents that will do their own business mm -hmm. that need, <clears throat> excuse me, less time and hand holding yep. and on the office side um no i think we're at we're at the mass we need to be um assuming that we're able to keep certain positions filled and some positions just don't stay filled very long yeah just the nature of the, the yeah, job yes absolutely a lot of turnover and stuff like that yeah so you know speaking of kind of that type of stuff getting into like technology um have you been using technology a lot in your strategies from like day to days to get successes and stuff like that? Or? Yeah, so it's interesting. When I was my first brokerage, I was at was uh, Century Twenty One Sussex and Riley, and their big thing to recruit agents was giving them a BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. So I had a BlackBerry in two thousand three. Damn the the road you yeah, know, the yeah, track yeah. wheel. Yeah, yeah, I still yeah. have mine. The, yeah. I still have I have every iteration of it <laughs> in, in my desk somewhere. But yeah. so I was always um, the sort of. Uh, on that front, at least communication front, I've always been um, someone who's uh, tried to make sure that I have the best technology available. Yeah. Um, more recently, um, with the advent of social media, or the importance of social media, we're doing more of that. Um, but technology to me is, and, and, and actually what, three or four years ago, we started using uh, Property Base, Salesforce okay. app. Yep. So to the extent that I will use technologies more to make sure that we all communicate well, not only within the group, but mm -hmm. to clients. Yep. 
but I'm not someone who really goes after the most recent yeah. uh, thing. You know, do we do drones and videos? Sure, but yeah. I'm not sure that's you know cutting exactly. edge. But yeah, yeah, I do. I do try to do it. And I try to make sure that um, it's uh, I'm keeping at least abreast. But I don't necessarily need to be ahead yeah. of anything. Yep. I actually believe that like half startups. the stuff that half the stuff that's the the brand new shiny thing ends mm -hmm. up not being and falls off anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, I'm a big proponent of that. I'll. I think I have a pretty good eye for what will work and what won't. I, I'll, I'll play with it and see. And if usually I think if I can't figure it out in two seconds, it's not worth it because most people also won't be able to figure it out. So exactly. I'm not going to invest in it. And yep. I made a couple big uh, um, investments that turned out to be nothing. Like one, we did Smart Zip one time. Mm -hmm. No offense, Smart Zip. We did that. <laughs> yeah. We did I, it. I was pissed because they were sending. I was spending like ten grand a month, and I was sending uh, uh, flyers to parking spaces. Yeah. Uh, and then I asked for some refunds for that, and they wouldn't give it. Did they disappear? Like, um, I think they're still there, but yeah. you know the, the pre predictive analytics. I think is is where you could really utilize it. I just don't think anybody's doing it right. Right. Uh, yeah. And we've tried with a couple of these companies, mm -hmm. and it's just it's nothing. Happens. It doesn't pan out. Yeah. In a perfect world, I think it'd be awesome if like somehow I could find out that there's a one bedroom condo and it's a couple living there and somebody's pregnant and I could start going after them. Yeah. You know? But yeah. I mean, that's the analytics just aren't there yet. I think I think yeah. it's a couple of years away, but I, yeah. you know, and I think you can start buying that technology soon, but stuff like that I think is interesting, but yeah. I agree. Although I think in our business, uh, the predictive analytics can only go so far. They can go up to the human decision point. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think unlike Before. a lot of industries where predictive analytics can actually bridge that gap entirely, mm -hmm. the couple who's pregnant in the one bedroom, who knows if they're looking for uh, another job. They have family that has a bigger unit in the Keep building. It like it's it. yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, I, I'm, I've, I I agree. Yes. I, I agree. Yeah. Predictive analytics is, is something yeah. that if it gets better can be worth it. But yeah, I, I was a smart zip uh, um, person for a bit, and it was a waste. But that's a big thing though too. Is like you know you're gonna you're gonna make mistakes in technology, and it's kind of getting back to that fear. I mean you know I'm sure there's been a lot of things. I know me too. Like you try stuff, you think it'll be big, you kind of get excited about it, and then like you. You start doing it, and I'll give it six months, and then if it fails, Nothing at least I know, like, hey, it. I tried, you mm -hmm. know? But what about, like, do, do you guys, would you say you invest a lot in technology? Um, a lot is a relative word. I, I would say that, um, for example, our property base uh, contact resource mm -hmm. uh, management, we spend a lot. In my mind, it's a lot. It's like 25 grand a year just mm -hmm. to have contacts yeah. Yeah. searchable, basically. Yeah. So that, to me, is a lot. Um, do I spend uh, a lot on um, sort of social media and other things? I'm, I'm about to. I'm going to start spending more. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, I think I, I mentioned this at some other panel Matt and I were on. I have never done a business plan. I really honestly, mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. more of a gut feeling. Now, granted, my business plan is those Wednesdays and Thursdays when I get my cash flows. Yeah. Yeah. That's my business yeah. plan. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I know what I can spend. <laughs> and I actually, and I look back the year yeah. before and the year before, I'm like, Peanut oh. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for everybody. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's it. No, right. But I mean, I, I look historically like, oh, this week, last year, the year before, the year before, the year before, we're actually, you know, X dollars ahead. So okay, fine. If something comes up that I want to spend yeah. money on that makes sense, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I have, um, I'm, I'm pretty uh, careful about sort of trying out the new stuff. I actually kind of wait for maybe guys like you, Matt, who <laughs> decide to do it. And if it looks like it works, then maybe I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, but uh, I try to be careful about that. Yeah. What, what about social media? So you said you're trying to start doing a yeah. big push on it. Um, I think you guys do a really, really good job on yeah. social media. Um, I, I think it's about <laughs> consistency, posting stories really well. Uh, I think I like the way you guys do it. It's got a good flow. Yeah. So it's in your it's listings, easy. like all the new listings and yeah. stuff. I think it yeah. looks really yeah, nice. I think it's, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Like, um, has that been a big thing? You taking on new talent? So I'm trying well, I'm, I'm looking at getting that, um, outsourcing that, not because I don't think what we have is good. Um, but although sometimes, uh, I would want it to be more consistent. Um, I think there is, you know, when you look at real estate pages, or in real estate Instagrams, um, I think yours is probably an exception, but you look at others, it's the same thing. It's mm -hmm. the house, the just sold, the this, the that. Yeah. So I, um, I reached out to a company that um, does social media for like the bigger developments in town, mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanna see what they have to offer to make our social media, not just Instagram, but our, our yeah. sort of our presence, be a little bit more, um, not quirky, but a little bit less real estate-y yeah. and more lifestyle and brandy yeah. so that someday when I walk off into the sunset, um, there's, there's some continuity and it's not me. In fact, what, three or four years ago, I, I rebranded from the Mario Greco group to the MG group yeah. so that people wouldn't be looking for Mario in 20 years when Mario isn't going to be running the group. Um, yeah. I so mean, 
to that. Yeah. A, a big yeah. thing about social media though too is like, and I, and I say this, like I get a lot of ideas from other companies that are not real estate. So I, yeah. I prefer to hire people that are not social media experts in real estate itself because I do think they're all the same. So, I mean, Agreed. sure we do a lot of stuff that it, other people then pick up on and do, mm -hmm. but we try to do like stuff like maybe a cool shoe company is doing. I'm like, shit, that's a good idea. We can, yeah. we can implement that into real estate. Right. So we try to follow other big you know, influencers in other businesses. Yeah. Yeah. That, with the website too. Yeah. When you're like yeah. looking at yeah. different people's yeah, websites. Like for website, all look the yeah. Same. We took, we took listings off a of website completely because yeah. nobody's coming to our site, the Matt Literacy Group, to right. search for listings. Mm -hmm. Right. They're coming to see who we are. Yeah. You know, and like some of my clients would be like, well, you don't have listings or website. I'm like, no shit. Like who's searching Matt Literacy yeah. Group and then going to search They're listings on Zillow on there? and yeah. 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 Realtor.com, Real, Zillow, yeah. Homes.com. I mean, all these fucking yeah. sites out there. So, yep. But like, I do think, um, I think people, especially the younger generation, not as much the older at all, but like the younger people want to go to your Instagram page and see something cool. And then yeah. like, exactly. Well, a lot of yeah. people think we're cooler because they're just like, I love the stuff you guys post. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, or they'll, they'll yeah. find us because of a post. I had a client, the other, yeah, I had a client the other day that recognized another team member just from like our, one of the videos on our Instagram. Yeah. Never yeah. met him, <laughs> knows yeah. his name, yeah. Like, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Agreed. And I think that's a, uh, <laughs> That's a big thing. So, like, knowing that you guys get in that, that's yeah. that's that's definitely good. But I do think you guys do like a really good uh, a job on it. And is there any uh, new technology that you're excited to start implementing into your business? No. <laughs> no. Any examples? Uh, I'm excited for voice. I'm trying to get involved in voice big time. I think voice is going to be the next big thing. I think people are going to start saying, uh, with the the turn of Alexa and all this other stuff, that people are going to saying. Uh, you know, Alexa, um, I want to sell my house. And they could say, hey, uh, Mario Greco's number is this, or let me give you the top three agents. Mm. Uh, and I, I'm like 85% positive that's where the business is going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the people who are going to spend the most are going to be the ones that are going to be at that top of that list. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be very, very that. competitive soon. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's it's a matter of time till everything is completely voice written. We're, gonna be, we're not going to have phones anymore. Everything's going to be some sort of technology is yeah. going to be ran. Because it takes, instead of saying like, you know, who scored the most uh, goals in 2004 yeah. and then like searching on Google, you're just going to say it and yeah. you know, they're going to tell you the answer. You. Right. Uh, so I think for real estate, getting ahead of that is going to mm -hmm. be, is going to be big. I just, yeah. I don't know how to get ahead in that. I can see that. I can see so that. I'm yeah. excited for it yeah. though, because I think it'll be cool. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how it's going to work yet, yeah. but I do think that's, that's the future. Um, market. What do you think has happened in the market? I mean, we're, we're in like kind of a shifting market right now. Uh, a lot of people are talking doom and gloom. Uh, what, do you, what are your feelings on it? So I think we are in a shifting market. I think the buyers are uh, in control in many price points and in many neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, I think sellers are still holding on to the past couple of years, but more and more of them are coming over. In fact, I've had, it's Wednesday, I've had four conversations with sellers um, all of which have agreed to drop their price by as much as five, if not 10% wow, on, that's big. on places. Yeah. But I've also looked at the numbers uh, just Monday. I just took a quick look. On Monday morning, uh, since Sunday night, so actually on Monday night, since Sunday night, so in 24 hours, and Monday's usually a big day for listings, in the neighborhoods that we do business in, which really is almost all of them, but it, I would say we go as far west as Pulaski to the lake, mm -hmm. as far south as um, Bridgeport, and as far north as you know the Rogers Park. In that area, in the MLS, across all property types, on on Monday morning, since Sunday of this past weekend, there were 125 new listings. Now, how many of them were cancel relists? I don't know, but let's just say there were 125. There were 61 price changes. Now, a year ago. Around a year ago, I did the same look. There were about the same number, a few, few, a few fewer listings, maybe a hundred, and there were about twenty price changes. Yeah. Okay, just randomly. Yeah. So, and of those price changes, the the average price change was almost eight percent. Now, again, uh, how many of those were cancel relists? How many of the price changes were overpriced, or how many listings were overpriced to begin with? I don't know, but that is telling me um, that there's a change. The other thing is telling me is a change is that deals are now. Um, being fought during the inspection period much more oh, than absolutely. they were last year and the year yeah. before. Yeah. And I'm not talking about, hey, you need to replace the windows. Yeah, it's more like, like, seventh, yeah, yeah, like uh, your, your stopper, your yeah. tub stopper's not working on $1,000. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you won't do it for me? Okay, deal's off. Yeah. Like right. that kind of stuff. And actually just this morning as I was walking in here, we sold the property yesterday, uh, day, one day on the market, um, full price offer. The minute it came on the market, um, agent, very responsible, brings your earnest money. Um, they wanted to see, take a quick look at it late last night because the husband hadn't yet seen the, the property. Yeah. Deal yeah. died this morning. 
Yeah, you get the letter. Tell you exactly what happened. Died this morning. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, yep. the husband, and the, and during the showing, the husband couldn't have been more happy and yeah. smiley. He's like, yeah. I love this thing. I love it. I love it. Yeah. They, who knows? They googled, you know, mm -hmm. stats, and all of a sudden he didn't like it. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. But that is, that is a October, November, December phenomenon, right. not a heart of the spring phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, I think, uh, coming. And I do yeah. think I was just interviewed in Cranes yesterday, or the day before. Um, I think that the market is going to uh, come down. It already has started. I don't think it's crashing like 08, 09, but I think it's going to float down, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to accelerate into the, into the uh, fall and winter. And then next year, who knows, with the election, election yeah. Brexit, China, all this stuff that we're talking about, when people are uncertain, the first thing they do is cut out the... Um, uh, uh, what do, I, what do I want to say? They, they cut out the non-necessary moves or non-necessary purchases or, or, or sales. And if they don't have to move or have to buy or sell, yeah. they're not it's going to. So we're, well, my don't. worry is we're going to have a transactionless bad market. Mm -hmm. right. Whereas in 08, 09, for brokers, it was amazing because there were transactions. Right. Whether or not your client lost mm -hmm. money, and if you're not yeah. friends with them, you don't care. <laughs> right. Who cares? Right. Yeah, you're still doing sales. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think there was a couple of big things that I read. Uh, one of them was is that... Uh, you know, last year we had 40% of sales for multiple bids uh, oh, yeah. up to this year. And then year to date, there's 15% of yep. multiple bids. I saw which that earlier this spring. Difference. Huge, yeah. huge difference. And then the fact that um, the first quarter there was only in the whole Chicago land, which is, you know, all suburbs, the suburbs yeah. and stuff like that, there's only 380 sales above a million bucks. Yeah. You know, which is yeah. like nothing. Yeah, and, and half of those are in one Bennett Park and right. nine West Walton mm -hmm. flips. Right. And yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah. it's kind of showing you that. You know, I personally don't think we're going towards uh, a doom and gloom. No. I just think we're going towards, I think we're, I think we're going towards a normal market. In the last three years, we're a little fictitious. And, you know, there's a, what, uh, the brokerage has doubled the amount of people that entered real estate. And, you know, sellers are used to these 48 hours. I, I had a conversation earlier today around 6.30 this morning, and my seller said, uh, I can't believe our place hasn't sold. And I was like, we, we've been on the market for 48 hours. <laughs> uh, like, relax. And I think people are just used to that. And, and a lot of brokers who haven't been around, are a little freaking out the fact that, hey, the business has gotten a little harder and yeah. they have to work a little mm -hmm. bit more. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I, I kind of like it because I think it's going to cut the fat a little bit. 100%. Know? We Look, the, because there's more info, because there are more agents, um, a seller or buyer is hearing from many more sources. Yeah. And in fact, today, one of my sellers that agreed to drop the price said, well, someone told me the part we're underpriced on parking. I'm like, really? Because we're 50 grand. And I don't think anyone's paying 50 grand for a parking spot anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look at uh, Lake Point Tower, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. when I first started in the business, parking spots were going for $100,000 a piece. They're now, if you get 30 for one, you're yeah. lucky. Why is that? Uber, Lyft, and everything else. Right. So people right. are listening to uh, so many other people. So our jobs yeah. are harder. But I agree with you. Eventually... Um, when it really, when the shit does hit the fan, like it did in 08, 09, people fly to quality and they will hire people that have been around and have proven themselves, right. not, yeah. you know, Redfin and, you know, Uncle Joe, who yeah. is a license right. in Bridgeview. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I'm actually excited for it. I think our, you know, our business is way up this year even too. And I think business is going to be better. For, we get more calls because people are like, Hey, I was with X. Right. Who, is new and they're a great guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like having drinks with them, but yeah. they don't know what they're doing. And I yeah. think, yeah. you know, the biggest advice I give to agents that are that are trying to figure out how am I going to survive the shift is just figure it out, learn the business as much as you can, because then people will go to use the resource. Yeah. So uh, we have what we call the fast five, where the co-host asks uh, sure. five questions. Catherine. All right. Um, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Do not in the business. Mm -hmm. Do not worry about spending money; um, it will come back to you if you spend it right. Nice, that's good. Um, do you love to win? This is Matt's favorite question. Or hate to lose? I hate to lose. <laughs> there we go. See? So you know the corporate answer is uh, to love to win. Love to just win. So you know. Yeah. I, when I go to Vegas, I don't gamble because I cannot win <laughs> enough uh -huh. to offset the pain of, of losing, losing a dollar. <laughs> yeah, and you'll always yeah. lose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Number three. Who is your biggest hero? I honestly don't have one. Really? I honestly don't have one. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. If you can have one superpower, what would it be? Uh, the ability to see the future. All right. That's, That's a good, good one. one. Yeah. And then last one. What makes you Chicago? Uh, born, raised, left for three years, came back, and no matter how high the taxes go or how many shootings are outside my house, I'm never leaving. That's good. That's, That's good. So where can people find you and what would you want to plug? Uh, they can find me uh, at mggroupchicago.com. Uh, 
our website kind of says everything about us. Uh, I think we are um, of the groups in the city and of the yeah. agents uh, probably nationwide. I think we have the best process and infrastructure of any of them. And part of that is by design and part of that is just organically grown. And I think if you work with us and you've worked with someone else in the past, both successfully, um, you'll see the difference right away. Nice. So make sure to tune in our next uh, episode and subscribe to our podcast. Thanks for listening to the Matt Lewis podcast.